How many of you have heard the phrase, when you hear hoofbeats, can you complete that? Anybody? Look for horses, but not, anybody? Ah, zebras. What? When you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras. Hi, everybody. I'm Neil Pfeiffer. Uh, I'm a UX designer on the user experience team. And uh, in past talks, you've heard me say some silly things like, quit trying to paint the barn with a hammer, uh, where we talked about the uniqueness in uh, user interfaces between expert and novice users. I need to go see a man about a horse, where it takes a good metaphor to sometimes be a bridge between the professional languages that often uh, make it hard for us to communicate between our different roles, both of which were said by my grandfather. But this year, when you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras, comes from our very own Dr. Wall. It was an interesting phrase that I heard that really kind of uh, stuck with me. And it's commonly used in medical practice when uh, uh, residents, as they are just uh, getting out of school and starting to do practice, uh, they are chocked full of knowledge of everything that they've had to memorize, and so they get on the floor and they start getting assigned patients, and they think everything is a zebra. And the attending has to remind them, no, think horses, not zebras. But the funny thing is, you think most of those decision-making ability of trying to weigh out between what's a horse and what's a zebra is very logical. It's very cognitive. But I'd argue that most of our decisions are all driven by emotion. And it doesn't seem like a, such a strange thought. Uh, emotions are about us, you know, every day. Uh, neurologists have found that when uh, certain patients have traumatic brain injury and they lose their emotion ability, they can't even perform simple decision-making tasks. Which apple to pick to eat for lunch? Which pair of new, new pair of shoes to buy? So, honestly, emotions kind of make us pretty smart. Uh, since they surround us, they give us that first indication of what's good, what's bad, uh, what's going to uh, be safe and comfortable versus what's going to be a danger. But what if our emotions sometimes change that ability to make logical decisions? They change the ability to recognize the stripes on a zebra. So I'm going to talk through a few stories that kind of show the example of how, if we're not careful, we might actually be hiding the stripes on a zebra from our users and only able to see the horses. First story, emotions guide behavior. This is Don Norman. He uh, has written this really interesting book called Emotional Design where he goes through and he lays out some of the tenets of what these different things are that guide us in our daily life as we interact with different objects, what causes us to be uh, happy to use certain things and disgruntled to use other things. Uh, there's three basic modes of processing that as we interact with each object uh, that, um, that we respond to. The first is visceral. It's that kind of quick response, that quick judgment. You don't even know you're doing it. You like it just because what it is, that red new uh, sports car or the smell of a rotten egg. It's that that gives you that first sense. Behavioral is something that we do every day. I'm walking up here, talking, breathing, not really thinking about it. It's just automatic. So those things that we interact with sometimes have this unique ability that we can just pick it up and use it and not even think. It's all muscle memory. And then certain things allow us to be reflective, allow us to see what we're doing, think, control, pause, and, uh, and savor the moment. His book goes through some different examples where you can see of the variety of different objects there, certain ones being quite elegant and beautiful. The... Uh, uh, the honey bear being very simple, but the round headlight on a uh, VW bug just giving you that little sense of happiness. The color on the camera, 
um, you know, the, the sharpness of the pen, just knowing what it does. But these are all just objects, objects that create this interaction with us. What we really deal with is more situations. How can situations change the way we emotionally respond uh, to the events? So if you guys remember last year, we did a little audience participation, and I thought we'd uh, have a little fun again this year. Um, so I need one volunteer. We're going to do two quick tasks. All you need to do is walk. Can anybody want to jump up on stage and do a quick walking task? Anybody? Come on. <laughs> we got somebody in the front row? Come on up. All right. Let's give him a round of applause. Do a little Cerner's Got Talent. Okay. I'm going to ask you to do two tasks. And after the end of each task, I'll ask you how you feel. All right? Okay. So very simple. I've got a little balance beam here on the floor. All you need to do is start at this end, okay. cross to the other end, and then step off. Think you can handle that? I think so. All right. Everybody, wait, drum roll. No. Yeah, whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what was your stress level? 1 being, you know, walk in the park, 10 being I'm never going to do that again. 2, mostly from being up here. Okay, excellent. 2, that's a good safe answer. Now, I'm going to raise the bar a little. Are you ready? <laughs> Task number two, walking. All you need to do, step on the chair, walk across the beam, step down the other chair. Okay. You ready? <laughs> sure. I've totally tried this. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay. Stop. Stop? Yep. I'm kidding. Okay. Come on down. No! Oh, he's going to do it! <laughs> wow! Now you really deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and again, what was your emotional level, your stress level, 1 to 10, just thinking about having to cross across these crazy chairs? 4. four. Oh, not any higher than 4? I'll go, I'll go 6. Okay, good. 6 is a good answer. <laughs> now... That's all we're doing, but what if I raised it 30 feet in the air? No. No. Good. <laughs> all right. Thank you. What's your name? I'm Nick. Nick. Everybody give Nick a round of applause. That's all we're doing. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So what that experience showed was that simply by taking the same activity and just changing one variable with it, you know, a plank on the floor, a plank three feet in the air, say a plank 30 feet in the air, immediately changes our stress response level. And so what that does is it creates a different reaction in what we could do when we're asked to perform those tasks. Now, if I had asked Nick to also do something else while, say, crossing the beam, like solve a puzzle, um, uh, maybe do a, a mathematical equation, um, maybe uh, uh, tie a shoe halfway through, all of a sudden, those tasks become infinitely harder as he's doing it because of that stress level. What happens is your adrenaline starts rushing in. You immediately focus on the task simply by adding the stress. You become a depth-first problem solver, as Don Norman calls it. But if you bring the plank back to the floor, emotion levels go down, everything's happy, dopamine kind of squirts into your brain, and now you become a breath-first problem solver. Some of this uh, research has also been done by psychologists who took a group of college kids, uh, tested um, giving them a hard task in a room. One group was given a bit of candy and a, a little bit of jokes beforehand, got them at ease. Each one of those groups was able to solve the problem. A second group was brought in and then was uh, told that this particular problem was going to be a very hard IQ test. And if they did not solve it, it was going to affect the way that they performed the rest of their life and it was going to be a permanent mark in their career. Uh, none of those groups were able to solve the simple puzzle simply because of the stress around the situation. Now, uh, Robert Sapolsky has written this very in-depth book which takes it even further, which goes into how your brain works, 
the one second before, the one minute before, the years before, how all of those uh, activities and chemical reactions in your brain affect how you make decision-making abilities when you're in stressful situations. Story number two. This is Julia Galef. Her TED Talk from 2016 takes the same two concepts, breath-first thinker and depth-first thinker, and gives it a different name. We'll listen to her. So, I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're a soldier in the heat of battle. Maybe you're a Roman foot soldier, or a medieval archer, or maybe you're a Zulu warrior. Regardless of your time and place, there are some things that are constant. Your adrenaline is elevated, and your actions are stemming from these deeply ingrained reflexes, reflexes rooted in a need to protect yourself and your side and to defeat the enemy. So now I'd like you to imagine playing a very different role, that of the scout. So the scout's job is not to attack or defend. The scout's job is to understand. The scout is the one going out, mapping the terrain, uh, identifying potential obstacles, and the scout may hope to learn that, say, there's a bridge in a convenient location across a river. But above all, the scout wants to know what's really there as accurately as possible. And in a, a real, actual army, uh, both the soldier and the scout are essential. But you can also think of each of these roles as uh, a mindset, a metaphor for how all of us process information and ideas in our daily lives. And what I'm going to argue today is that Having good judgment, making accurate predictions, uh, making good decisions, is mostly about which mindset you're in. So, to illustrate these mindsets in action, I'm going to take you back to 19th century France, where this innocuous looking piece of paper launched one of the biggest political scandals in history. What Julia is talking about there is the Dreyfus Affair, where in 1894, uh, Alfred Dreyfus was an uh, officer in the French army and accused of selling secrets to Germany. Now, the problem was that letter that Julia showed was torn up, ripped in a wastebasket, and on very crude evidence of uh, no handwriting tests, um, some associations with, with Dreyfus to... Um, having uh, studied foreign languages in the past, other officers immediately accused him wrongly simply because they had strung together some of these details. He was accused, sent into prison, and uh, all the mi meanwhile maintained his innocence. Two years later, George Picard noticed that the uh, spying was still going on with Germany and that he was able to locate a different officer with a perfect handwriting match. He was able to find more incriminating evidence that was accurate. But because the high-ranking officers had already found their, uh, uh, their traitor, they made up a new story that did not fit, or basically, since George Bacart's story was challenging uh, the, the Dreyfus story, they did not want to update their mindset and uh, it ended up taking the, uh, the new accused um, officer, acquitting him in two days, charging Picard with uh, conspiring to murder, and actually adding more charges to Dreyfus for uh, even more treason charges. Now, don't you worry, uh, Dreyfus was eventually cleared, was freed, but we have to look at why this situation was one of the most unjust uh, criminal situations um, in history, and how it could go on. And Julie argues that it's because soldier mindset is motivated reasoning. In other words, you form that story, you're walking across that plank, you've got a task to do, you need to solve uh, one step in front of the other, and you don't look for any new information to update your beliefs. However, like George Picard, if they had switched to scout mindset, they would have adopted more of a considered Bayesian reasoning, where we're allowed to uh, take a look at the landscape, not be influenced by any one previous information, and then continuously update the likelihood of something to be true. It's more of the logical mindset. So for those of you that don't know Bayes' theorem, I'll give you a quick uh, uh, run-through. 
It's really just the probability of a hypothesis, given a new piece of evidence is true, where you multiply the prior, uh, prior pr probability of the hypothesis times the pri probability of the evidence to be true, given that the hypothesis is true, divided by the total probability that the evidence was true in the first place. OK, you got that? <laughs> All Bayes' theorem really says is it's a statistical probability that continuously updates the probability of something being given true uh, based on new information compared to the last time it was being uh, calculated. It's just a mindset. It's a way to do breadth-first processing, the scout mindset. You take a look, you honor new information, you weigh it against the old, and you keep your mind open and free. You allow your mind to see whether it's logically going to be horses, not zebras. Because if you stay in a particular mindset, you might be missing the stripes. You might think you're seeing a horse, but in reality, everyone else can see a zebra. And that's what situations can do. That's what different mindsets, that's how emotions can kind of gover, govern our logical decision-making ability and the danger of that. So how can we at Cerner encourage perspective switching? So. If we take a look at some of the characteristics of soldier and scout mindset, knowing that soldier is depth first, they're task oriented, scouts are breath first. If you think about most of our clinical uh, professionals, they're usually always gonna be in, in soldier mindset, whether they like it or not. It's just their daily routine of it's busy, I've got a lot of patients, I've got a lot of decisions to make, I've gotta get through this. So adrenaline, stress, and focus are characteristic of the soldier mindset but happy and relaxed are the scout mindset. Quick trained responses for soldiers, but slow tactical responses. If it takes reactive thinking, which is good for the soldier mindset, what would we have to do to stop someone in their tracks and pause, uh, put a pause and then create a new opportunity for critical thinking? The soldier values a checklist, something they can just run through step by step, putting one foot in front of the other across the beam. But a scout needs an empty canvas, no rules. The soldier uses the linear workflow. The scout has a nonlinear workflow. Where do we have that where we're stopping users at certain points where the system knows, hey, maybe this isn't a horse, and start to evaluate those, uh, whether it really is a zebra situation. A soldier likes prompts and suggestions, easy answers. Machine learning is going to be great with this, but a scout should have no auto prompts. They should have options, never answers. And the soldier mindset values speed and efficiency. You gotta get through the, uh, the, the punch list quickly, but a scout needs time for discovery and assembly. Story number three. So we've seen how a scout mindset can affect uh, officers to keep motivated reasoning such that it affects and clouds their ability to craft a new story. But what's really interesting is what happens when you lose someone. Each of us kind of have a narrative, a story of our life, our relationship with the folks around us. And uh, when someone dies, we have to also mindset shift in order to get out. This is Hannah Rosen. She's a uh, NPR correspondent. And she's on, uh, she is an anchor on the uh, uh, podcast Invisibilia. She recently had a story that uh, she was talking about her mother and uh, the fact that she had just lost her father. And I've got a little audio clip that we can listen to. The whole thing started with a loss. The kind of <clears> loss <throat> that subtracts from your life something so central that you no longer really know who you are. About a year earlier, her husband, my father, who was a super vital guy, was diagnosed with a rare stomach cancer and died within a few weeks. Healthy, athletic, to death. It just did not compute in your head what went wrong here. They'd been married for 51 years and they did everything together, everything. Like he drove her to the subway every morning, he picked her up in the evening, he made her tea every night, and it had been that way for over 50 years. Every inch of their lives, they had walked together, and my mother had no way of understanding her life story without him. 
do you feel, what thoughts about Ellie's death were going through your head over and over? Uh, could I do more? Did we miss anything? Why didn't I just take him and went to another hospital? All day long, all day long it hit me. Could I save? Month after month she went on like this, scratching circles into her brain, unable to make her way out. Don't wanna eat, I don't wanna cook, I don't wanna, completely stuck. But then, as the first anniversary of his death approached, I got a text which suggested a very different kind of thought had bloomed in her head. That thought was her mother wanted to go skydiving. Now you may wonder, skydiving? This is a woman who hasn't been able to get out of the house for the last year. She hasn't been able to go to the local deli or the grocery store. So what was it that caused her to re-examine and shift and be able to uh, jump for something so radical. So Hannah went and talked with James Pennebaker, who uh, has this really interesting project. He has been working with uh, folks that would get drastically sick after having a traumatic incident, and by keeping it private, they would actually get physically sick. And so he wanted to try and link and, uh, and discover why is it that by keeping something private and internal actually gives you physical ailments when it's something that's traumatic within your memory? So he had folks come in and journal. He had a suspicion that writing out your uh, uh, experiences would be a way to, to, uh, to gain back to health. And so what he did was he built this uh, the system called Linguistic in Inquiry and Word Count, Luke, uh, for shorthand. And what he would do is he would take all of these narratives that his patients were submitting and he would just run through them and just see what they were saying. He had some suspicions in terms of, of there might be commonalities in terms of which patients were progressing and which weren't. And would they make themselves known within the language that they were using? And it turns out there was, and it was in something that he entirely did not ex expect. It was in the simple pronouns, the short little words. He said that I words, being an I mode, shows a really independent thinker, but somebody who overly uses I words, I, me, my, and they can't seem to shift out of that, exactly like you heard Hannah Rosen's mom say, where uh, what could I have done more? What was I going to do? Because when somebody loses somebody uh, so significant that their story now changes, they have to figure out what to do. Do they continue working on with the old story, going through life even though pieces don't fit anymore? Or do they craft a new, a new narrative? And so it's only through when patients start to shift and start using these transitive words, or the, uh, the, the uh, uh, he, she, we, uh, the other perspective that shows that a person is able to put themselves into another person's shoes what was that person thinking? What would that person have done? What would that person like me to do as uh, carrying on? And that's exactly what happened with uh, Hannah Rosen's mother. She spent a long time thinking, what could I have done more? And then all of a sudden, one night, she realized, if he had been here and I was gone, what would I want him to do for me, uh, with me gone? And I thought I would be 100% Yes, that he should go on with his life, live it, and experience things f fully. So that simple act of being, uh, of changing perspective and thinking about what her spouse would have wanted allowed her to clear that fog of depression. Now, you're probably still wondering, skydiving, where did that come from? Well, after 50 years of marriage, they had done pretty much everything together, uh, except for in 1967, uh, Hannah Rosen's father was a paratrooper in um, Tel Aviv during the war. And there was a time where his truck broke down, uh, and so there was a knock at the door, and they'd been hiding in a bunker, and they usually knew what that meant, that somebody was coming to give them bad news. But it turns out it had been uh, their father who had hitchhiked all the way back to Tel Aviv just to uh, sneak in a kiss for the night and then go back to the war. Skydiving was the one thing that 
Hannah Rosen's mother hadn't done with her spouse. So that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to go up into the plane, jump out, have this brief moment of perspective embrace with her, uh, with her gone spouse, close one chapter, and essentially open another. And this is exactly what she did. She, uh, they went up, terrified, the two of them, jumped, and now back on the ground. The simple act of perspective switching allowed her mother to get out of the depression, go back to the daily streets and the delis and the, uh, uh, and the grocery stores where uh, she had so missed seeing her, her spouse, and then make a new life. So, your assignment. You didn't know you were getting an assignment today. But this is what I want you to think about. As you go through the rest of your day, as you go home tonight, look at all the objects around you. Look at the situations you're in. What mindset are they putting you in? Are some more enjoyable than others? Are some creating stress and soldier mindset? Are some putting you at ease and you can freely think and put uh, uh, creative ideas together, being a scout? And then when you're back at your desk tomorrow, look at our tools, look at the solutions that we're making. Are we doing enough to keep our users uh, in the right mindset for the task they need to do at hand? Because if we're not, we might be straight preventing them from being able to see the zebra stripes. So we have to ask ourselves what more we can do to help everyone shift perspective. And that's it. Thank you.